Elizabeth Mandala was a popular senior at Kempner High School in Sugarland, Texas, about 20 miles south of Houston. The pictures on her Facebook page show a pretty blonde with a sweet smile, but others hint at a different side of her, one that may have gotten her killed. And after her beaten body was found in Mexico with the bodies of two older men, those who knew her started asking who she really was. Elizabeth Mandala was born on March 13, 1992, in Sugarland, a suburb located in the metropolitan area of Houston, United States. Although details about her family are not widely known, it is recognized that her parents were Paula Benitz, a Mexican woman who emigrated to the United States, and Robert Mandala, an Italian-American citizen who was a building remodeling contractor. The couple had four children in total, Adriana, the eldest, followed by Elizabeth, then Daniel, and finally Yvette. The Mandalas lived on a small ranch on the outskirts of Sugarland, where Robert had a stable for horses, in addition to an indoor track. There, the beautiful and loving Elizabeth spent a happy childhood, loving horseback riding and helping her father take care of them. Her passion for animals was more than evident. Elizabeth had an excellent sense of humor. She was funny and entertaining, always making everyone in her house laugh. Her divine personality, coupled with her intelligence and beauty, made her shine from the first day at school. Not only did she achieve excellent grades, but she also had many good friends. Her happiness was interrupted when, at the age of 10, her parents decided to divorce, and Robert left the house to move to the other side of town. Although the separation was amicable, the sweet girl lamented that her father no longer lived with them. Two years later, in 2004, her sister Adriana, at 18 years old, became pregnant and moved into her own apartment. For Elizabeth, this was a hard blow as Adriana was her accomplice. With Adriana's absence, Elizabeth felt very lonely since her mother was too busy raising her younger siblings, and she felt she never had time for her. These two losses caused Elizabeth to feel abandoned, after which she became somewhat rebellious and no longer wanted to spend much time at home. Therefore, after school, she preferred to spend the rest of the day at Adriana's house or with a friend. The issue was that she usually did not inform Paula of her plans, where she was, with whom, or what time she would return. It's unclear why, but the girl preferred to stay away from her mother. With each passing day, she gave fewer explanations, even once before turning 16, disappearing for a weekend with a friend. Paula, distressed by not having news of her daughter, called the police to report her missing. Fortunately, it was just a mischievous act and the incident did not escalate further. The two girls had decided to go out with their friends to drink and have a good time. When the two-day party ended, she returned home safe. Despite being a partygoer in her youth, Elizabeth did not neglect her studies or extracurricular activities. She was a popular girl at her high school where she actively participated in many tasks and rarely missed classes. In addition to playing on the school's soccer team, she was a member of a program that prepares students who want to pursue careers as officers in the United States Armed Forces. Elizabeth also participated in a program which aims to help students prepare for high performance in college. Moreover, she was involved with the Future Farmers of America organization, a youth institution that promotes and supports agricultural education. She was eager for a better future, hence she engaged in activities that would help her make the best decisions. Since turning 16, Elizabeth and her sister Adriana became almost inseparable. By 2008, her nephew, whom they named Troy, was an adorable three-year-old boy whom Elizabeth often cared for when her sister needed it. On other occasions, they hired a babysitter so the two girls could enjoy the nightlife. Adriana also encouraged her sister to study veterinary science, while Elizabeth, in turn, motivated her to resume high school with the idea of pursuing a career in the field of medicine later on. Alongside her studies, Elizabeth began working as a waitress at a restaurant, but soon realized that her salary was not enough. Therefore, she decided to work as a secretary at her father's company, attending three times a week after finishing her classes. 
Then in late 2009, Elizabeth traveled to Italy for the first time to meet her paternal family. Celebrating the new year in Rome, her aunt suggested that after graduating from high school, she should move to Italy to study at a university there. Elizabeth loved the idea and immediately set it as a goal to achieve. So once the vacation was over, she returned to finish her last semester of high school, but with the determination to earn a lot of money quickly to fund her project. Under this pressure, Elizabeth innocently fell for an internet scam. An unknown person asked her for $2,000 with the promise of returning twice the investment in a couple of months. She asked many people for money for this, who warned her that she was probably being deceived. Nonetheless, she went ahead and ended up transferring $2,000 to an account in England, hoping for a return. But she never saw her profit or the money she sent. Despite what happened, Elizabeth continued with her idea of earning enough money to go to Italy. She never spoke of the scam again and kept looking for ways to raise the money she had set out to collect. Elizabeth continued working with her father in the afternoons, but secretly found a way to occupy her nights unconventionally. It's unclear how she managed it, but for a few months she became a successful exotic dancer at a gentleman's club in the neighboring city of Pasadena. She became particularly popular among the owners of the place, to the point that her photo appeared in a Houston nightlife guide under her stage name. However, none of her acquaintances had any idea about her movements in the adult entertainment world. In March 2010, Elizabeth turned 18 and decided to celebrate her coming of age in a big way. That night, the birthday girl didn't stop drinking. Under the influence of alcohol, she became more outgoing than usual, becoming vulgar and impertinent. Her older sister did not approve of this behavior and asked her to stop drinking, but Elizabeth ignored her and they began to argue. Adriana was very upset and left the place. After that day, the once close sisters stopped speaking to each other. Days later, Elizabeth mentioned to her mother that she was interested in becoming a coyote, a term used to refer to a person who smuggles illegal immigrants across the United States border. Someone had told her that this was a way to make a lot of money quickly, but Paula did not take the comment seriously, thinking it was just another of her daughter's jokes exaggerating to be funny as always. The truth is that Elizabeth was becoming a young woman who aspired to make more and more money to achieve what she had set out to do. Time was running out for her to fulfill her desires, to graduate with honors, be the prom queen, and go to Italy to study. There's no certainty, but everything indicates that she was living a kind of double life, even publishing anecdotes on her social media profile about an apparent relationship with a sugar daddy, that is a wealthy, much older lover who indulged her whims. On April 10, 2010, Elizabeth was involved in a multi-car collision with six other vehicles on Route 59. She did not sustain a single scratch, but had to take the car for repairs the next day she rented a vehicle. Two weeks later, on the afternoon of Tuesday, April 27, the young woman left her mother's house in the rented vehicle. She did not notify anyone of her destination, although there are versions suggesting she mentioned meeting a friend in Mexico. The next day, she posted a message on social media stating she was in Mexico and would return the following day. When she did not show up for work at the office, her father sent her a text message asking where she was. She replied that she was in Mexico. Her father became alarmed and told her she had no idea how dangerous it was to be alone in the neighboring country and that she also needed to return to school. In a subsequent message, he reiterated the immense risk she was running. Then on Thursday, the distressed father sent another message trying to reason with her. He clarified that he understood she was not aware of the danger she was exposed to, but it was best for her to return home immediately for her own safety. But Elizabeth did not respond. Adriana found out his sister's phone was active and began to call her several times but the call was always transferred directly to voicemail. Friday night came and Paula had been sending messages to her daughter on social media for two days with no response. Although she wanted to respect the girl's decisions, she was too worried and upset at the same time, and she feared Elizabeth might get into trouble and ruin her graduation. It seemed that after all, the idea of becoming a coyote was not a joke. The mother, though distressed, decided to wait until the next day before going to the authorities. They could never have imagined that just the next morning, on Saturday, May 1st, 
2010, around 6 a.m., Mexican authorities would find the lifeless body of Elizabeth, along with two Mexican men, in the back of a black pickup truck. Apparently, the three occupants had died when the truck crashed into the back of a semi-truck. The men were identified as a 38-year-old merchant and a 44-year-old taxi driver. Both were friends and natives of a municipality near Mexico City, but apparently had connections in Monterey. Back in Houston at noon that Saturday, Paula went to the police station accompanied by her eldest daughter to report Elizabeth's disappearance. She told the police that the missing girl was driving a rented car when she left the city. A few hours later, they would receive the terrible news. An official from the United States consulate in Mexico called to inform them that they had found the lifeless body of their daughter. In Mexico, authorities had no clear leads on what had happened to the girl. Investigators originally believed that the pickup truck was speeding and, as a result, crashed into the truck. However, the cargo vehicle's driver told the police that the pickup was traveling erratically, veered into his lane, and hit him from behind, and he could not avoid the impact, even though he reduced speed. As the investigation deepened, detectives noticed that it was not a common accident. The bodies were stacked in the back seat of the vehicle, and when the authorities conducted the examination, they observed that the accelerator had been jammed with a stone. Detectives found false identification documents in possession of one of the deceased. The identification found was an ID and a driver's license with his photo, but under another name. Meanwhile, when comparing the fingerprints of the other victim, it was determined that he had a criminal record. When the relatives of both men were interviewed, they stated that on Thursday, April 29th, they saw them leave together from their town, but were unsure why they were traveling to Monterey. The investigation could not establish how Elizabeth ended up in Monterey with these two men, let alone what their connection was. Meanwhile, autopsies determined that the victims died 10 hours before the accident, after having been severely beaten. The causes of death were head and body traumas inflicted with a blunt object. Experts clarified that although the bodies showed injuries from the accident, it was impossible for the lethal injuries to have resulted from the crash, given that the collision was not that severe. Not even the front windshield of the vehicle was broken, nor were there signs that the occupants had hit it. In the end, everything indicated that the perpetrators of the triple homicide had simulated a traffic accident, but there were no definite leads, or at least none were thoroughly investigated. The truck driver who had suffered minor injuries was ruled out as a suspect. Meanwhile, Elizabeth's classmates and friends in Sugarland were shocked by the news, many unable to hold back tears in the middle of the classroom, finding it incredible to think they would never see the young woman again. The principal of the school wrote a letter to the parents of the school stating that the young woman had died while traveling to Mexico over the weekend and without further details. He only added that the news had saddened the staff and student body and reiterated that their hearts and prayers were with the family. The Mandala family, for their part, refused to make statements to the media. Adriana simply described the investigation as a very delicate situation without giving further details. The United States consulate worked with the Mandala family and Mexican authorities on the investigation. The family of the girl exhausted their savings to transport the body from Monterey to Houston until finally the funeral was held on Thursday, May 6, 2010. The funeral for the 18-year-old was celebrated at St. Teresa Catholic Church. None of her loved ones spoke during the ceremony, which gathered about 500 people. At the same time, her friends and classmates left heartfelt messages on the sidewalks in memory of the girl. On social media, many of her acquaintances posted morning messages, very charged with emotion. A young woman wrote that no one, especially Elizabeth, deserved what happened to her, but she trusted in God's justice. Another girl named Angela recounted that when Elizabeth's name was mentioned during an exam, sighs and screams were immediately heard in the classroom. She also considered her friend an angel on earth. Meanwhile, days later, the spokesperson for the Houston Police Department explained that once the victim's body was identified and matched the identification provided in their missing person report, they had to close the case as they could not intervene in the investigation because it was outside their jurisdiction. In turn, according to the rules of the Department of State, 
the United States consulate is supposed to follow up on violent crime investigations involving victims from that country abroad, but they explained to the media that they could not disclose any further information because they had not received a privacy waiver from the Mandela family. So very few details of the investigations were known. Subsequently, the General Prosecutor's Office of Mexico announced that they had no more information to provide about the case, leaving the police, the families of the two men, and the friends and relatives of Elizabeth in the dark about why the three were together in that place or even how they met. With no leads to follow, the case was declared unresolved. Since then, various hypotheses circulated through media outlets, digital portals, and social media, especially when it became public knowledge that Elizabeth had been an exotic dancer with aspirations of becoming an illegal immigrant smuggler. One of the most substantial hypotheses suggests that while working as a stripper, Elizabeth met the two men. They might have introduced her to the job of a coyote and invited her to the northern border of Mexico to get her involved in the business. For years, Houston has been a center of operations for Mexican criminal gangs that have established solid networks for distributing narcotics. The border states of Mexico are under the war waged between drug cartels. These organizations have control over all illegal operations, including human trafficking across the border. It's presumed that when Elizabeth and the men who recruited her came into contact with the person in charge of the business, the transaction went wrong and they were executed. In November 2011, taking Elizabeth's case as an example, the Houston Department of Public Safety warned parents about the growing presence of drug cartels seeking to attract minors to transport narcotics and illegal immigrants across the border. It's said they prefer young people because they are more vulnerable and able to slip through the legal system undetected. There have also been cases in the area of teenagers being held by these groups for ransom. Meanwhile, in Mexico, the power wielded by the cartels limits the actions of both the police forces, often the subject of bribes, and journalists who face the fear of being executed if they delve into investigations about these criminal organizations. In fact, according to Reporters Without Borders, Mexico is the second most dangerous country for journalists. In the end, everything has remained in the shadows, leaving only pain and resignation for the family of Elizabeth Mandela, a beautiful young woman who lost her life in a tragic trip, which only leaves more questions than answers. The idea that Elizabeth led a double life as a stripper and outstanding student seems incredible to many of her friends. In any case, there's a lot of speculation surrounding the case, but it seems that driven by the pursuit of money, the protagonist of this story got involved in activities that became unmanageable at her young age. Unfortunately, it all points to the truth never being discovered, and those responsible for her demise remaining unpunished. Meanwhile, the shows of affection in her memory help her loved ones channel the pain. And so ends today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. See you soon.